Welcome. Welcome, fellow Sean, and welcome uh, everybody to another essential conversation here at Wellbeings. Here we are, and um, I am sitting here with a man that I am so happy to spend time with. Uh, I spent a, I spent, I have spent a little bit of time chatting to this gentleman, and my heart has been um, affected for days afterwards. So I'm inviting everybody there now to take a cup of tea, sit down, put the feet up, and get comfortable. Um, we're going to have a conversation here, and I hope if anything touches you along the way of us sharing Sean's journey and his his passions, his his uh, heartfelt passions. Just notice, notice what happens as we as we commune and dwell with one another in this realm of uh, um, shared shared loves and likes and um, and philosophies and, and yeah, just uh, inspirational uh, moments. So Sean is a special man. Um, let me read a little bit about him here. Um, Sean, Father Sean, was ordained a priest. Uh, in 1972 and worked for 14 years in Kenya. Sean is also uh, he has an MA and a PhD in transpersonal psychology. Sean has is a spiritual director of um, a very special community called Companions on the Journey, Companions on the Journey, and all the links I'll have below uh, if anybody wants to follow up on this, and Sean's also an author of five books and a co-author of his sixth uh, that we're going to list below for you to take a look at, and um, and I suppose he's a poet, he's a storyteller, he's got a scientific mind, so he's grounded a bit. He has. A, he's a priest. He's. Uh, he has. A, he's. A, he's a wisdom carrier. You know. There's all these wonderful things that he's developed over a life. And I suppose, Sean, how did it all start? You know, I heard a little bit about your your childhood. Let's maybe start there if that feels okay. Like, how did how did you start to get adorned with a sort of direction that has you where you are today? How did it all start? So I was the firstborn of a firstborn of a firstborn Nigel. And so I was actually raised by my grandparents for the first six years of my life. And my great grandmother was still alive. And she was, she was literally a Christian mystic. For her, uh, Mother Mary was more real than you and I are to each other. So she would have these out loud conversations with Mary throughout the day. And I was privileged to hearing these. You know? And that's so Mary was as real to me as, you know, as my gra great grandmother was. So she had these ongoing conversations nonstop. And then at age six, I was taken back by my parents. And I lived with mm -hmm. another set of grandparents, my mother's parents, and uh, my grandfather on that side, whom I called Daddy Jim, was um, he was a druid, in a sense. He was a brilliant musician. He played all kinds of musical instruments. He was an expert in Irish step dancing, and he was the greatest storyteller I've ever come across. So he filled me up with all the ancient Irish mythology, the Red Branch Knight, from Ulster, the Fenian tradition, you know, Oisin, Fionnachol, Neve Kiloir, Tir Fahang, Tir Nolog, all these places. And so I had this extraordinary mixture of kind of um, mystical Christianity and Celtic wisdom. And then when I went to Kenya, you know, I was raised kind of bilingually, Gaelic and, uh, and English. In fact, all my education up to uh, the end of high school was through Gaelic. And then I went to Africa and I had the, uh, the privilege of learning four Kenya languages and dipping into the mythology of Africa. And what I found out is that stories are the archived wisdom of a culture. You know, we kind of grandiosely think in the West that mythology is kind of the, uh, the mishugas made up by primitive peoples who don't understand science. People who make that statement understand neither mythology nor science. So mythology for me is how ancient peoples archive their wisdom over generations. And if you want to get a very pithy articulation of a, a, a story, go to their proverbs. Proverbs are like one-line distillations of a story. So if you really want to know the wisdom of any people or any culture, look at their mythology and look at their proverbs. Between 
the, my last, my second last year in high school and my last year, so we like the fifth year in our education system, I spent the entire summer in a village in West Cork called Kuala, where, where Irish is still the mother tongue there. And I was collecting proverbs. In Gaelic, we call them Shanochil, which literally means ancient words. And I went around the entire village collecting proverbs. And I'd ask you know, the old men and old women, give me a proverb and then tell me in what context would you use it? And I remember one old man saying to me, he said, if Christianity had never come to Ireland, we could live according to the Proverbs. And he was absolutely right, because the Proverbs are the distillation. And I would say the same thing after being a missionary for 14 years in Africa. If Christianity had never come to Africa, they could live according to their own Proverbs, because that's where well, you find Buddhism. <clears throat> yeah. What would be one of the Proverbs that you heard in that little village in Cork? And what would be one that you heard in Kenya? Uh, interesting. So very, very often it's the realization that proverbs seem to contradict each other because life is so multifaceted that as soon as you say A is true, there'll be a situation in which A is not true and B is true. And so, for instance, let's say in English you'll say, um, look before you leap, but he who hesitates is lost. So they seem to contradict each other, but they're both true in different circumstances. In Gaelic, we say stuff like... Um, um, there's no fireside like your own fireside but we also saw say there's a special taste to the neighbor's food when you're a child and you go to the neighbors you think their grub is excellent but you want to be at home at night time and in, in Swahili we have these two great proverbs we say hurry hurry has no blessing but we also say chilewa chilewa siwako delay, delay, and the baby will not be yours. Go figure that one out. <laughs> so that was one of the first things I learned, that Proverbs appear to contradict each other because life is so multifaceted that there are situations in which the opposite of what, what you need to do in one situation is what's called for in a different kind of situation. So these are some of the things that I learned. Yeah, I, 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 I can't, again, I can't remember exactly what was said, but I, I, I remember believing what you, what, what, Earlier in my life, that myths and and stories they were just they were just they were just they were untruths, you know. They were like 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 fairy tales, you know. And that's and I had that sort of belief. And then I studied the work of, of Joseph Campbell for a long time, and that was the right. very thing. That's the essence that you're talking about. That distillation of of a history, of the of the lived lives that was in stories, and then these distillations into parables you know or 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 characters even as well as the proverbs you know and uh, you're so true and I, I love that that's one of the things i've often thought about is um wishing that i'd learned gaelic more you know right. to possibly remember some of those beautiful things so so you had this you were learning this in ireland and then you were seeing it in africa absolutely what was, so what was happening in your mind as you were there, Sean, and you were you were getting this sort of wisdom, remembering as, as I hear you talk, sort of like a remembering of of from some part of yourself that was happening in Africa. What was that time like for you? It felt like a big cultus. <laughs> I tell you a funny story, Nigel. <laughs> Sometimes you need to be get beaten upside the head. Uh, I lived in a mission from 1973 to 1979 in a little village called Kip Chim Chim, among the Kipsigis people. And I was about five miles from a local town called Karicho, which was the center of the tea growing district of Kenya. And it was 40 miles from the biggest lake in Africa. The colonialists called it Lake Victoria, but the real name is, and it's back now again, it's called Lake Kisumu. And Lake Kisumu is the biggest lake in Africa. And because of the proximity of the lake, we got violent thunder and lightning storms on a regular basis, on a daily basis. And so one day I'm sitting in my office, I got a phone in my office, you know, it's stapled on, the, the wire is coming from outside, it's stapled onto the wall, every six inches there's a staple, the wire, wire to the wall, and it's feeding down into a big battery. And stupidly, I'm sitting on my desk, I'm writing with my right hand, and I got my left elbow up on top of the phone. And lightning struck the line right outside the house. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard lightning. It's like you take a, a, a crate full of glass and smash them, it goes, <laughs> You know, it's totally different from thunder. It's instantaneous. And so all of a sudden, the wire is coming off the wall. 
the staples are going like a machine gun firing across the room. The, the battery exploded and I got fired across the room. I'm lying in the corner. I have no idea how long I was out, whether it was seconds or minutes. I wake up and my entire left arm from the shoulder to the fingertips is blue. There's like a blue aura around the entire uh, arm. And I have no, long, I have no idea how long I was out. But <laughs> immediately after that, I had I started having these extraordinary, I could only describe them as interdimensional experiences, like visionary experiences off-planetary encounters with um, elementals, what we might call in Ireland fairies, you know, mm -hmm. what we might call ETs, extraterrestrials, or extra-dimensionals, or angelic beings. And so I recorded a whole bunch of these, and it totally kind of uh, reformulated what I call my personal cosmology. So now I'm taking the mythology of Ireland, I'm taking the mysticism of my great-grandmother, I'm taking the folklore of Africa, and now I'm creating a synthesis that allows me to create what I call my own personal cosmology. And a personal cosmology you must do four things for you. Firstly, it has to explain adequately your own unique experiences of life. There has never been another Nigel F McFarland on planet Earth up to now. You've got a unique combination of experiences. The second thing is it must make your heart sing. It must raise you above the fray. The third thing is you've got to keep you know, upgrading it because it's different. And fourthly, it has to stretch you out of your comfort zone. And so that's been kind of my journey, my safari, you know, since since then. I'm trying to figure out, you know, with this new experience I'm having or that new relationship I'm having, what am I learning from it? How can I harvest everything, the good, the bad, and the ugly, in order to see deeper and deeper into the mystery of love and life and laughter? So that's the kind of the journey that my great-grandmother, my grandfather, and Africa set me on. Wow. What are those four things to distill, um, you know, to really help you get a handle on being on this planet, you know, to like really help you get a handle being in this body, you know, get a handle how to be with others and and hopefully be in a, in a community of some sort. But can you say those four things again, just for the viewer? Because you know, I felt the transmission there. I, I've, I've, I remember two of them, but could you say the four of them again? Yeah. Is there any particular order? Sean, are they, are they circular or linear? Doing, doing all four at the same time. All four at the same time. So let me just preface it by saying that all of the great avatars that come among us are basically saying one single thing. The Buddha, uh, Gautama Siddhartha called himself the Buddha, which literally means I am awake. Jesus Christ would say if the householder knew at what stage the thief was going to break in and steal, he wouldn't go to sleep. You know, And uh, Socrates says the unexamined life is not worth living. So it's, be, it's incumbent upon every single one of us to create a kind of a personal cosmology, which we, we're not just borrowing from others, from the TV or from the teachers or from the church or from the politicians. We have to fashion it from our own experiences of life. And then it does to do four things for us. The first thing is it has to be unique to you. You can't borrow somebody else's cosmology, not the churches, not the political one, not the financial one. You can see you can see it as you know examples, but you have to create your own your own version of it. The second thing is it must stretch you out of your comfort zone. Thirdly, you have to keep updating it because you're having new experiences. And fourthly, it has to make your soul sing. It has to give you the ability to rise above the fray and see a totally different reality mm. that you're being, where you've come from and where you're going back. Because life is a devolutionary and an evolutionary process. We come from source. Then we adopt a, a separate soul, then a psychic body, then a mental body, then an astral body, then an etheric body, and then a physical body. And that's the low point of the, the cycle. And then we go back up, we reconnect with our etheric energy body, then with our astral body, then with our mental body, then with our psychic body, then with our soul body, and finally we go back up to source, to God. And we repeat that cycle through incarnation. It's like driving a bicycle. If you put a piece of tape on your wheel, you know, at one stage it's at the top of the wheel, and then it's halfway down, and then it's at the bottom, and then it's halfway up, and then it's the top again. It keeps going round and round. Every time we reincarnate, whether it's in this planet or in a different dimension, you know, we're trying on different costumes because God has created for us a kind of a theme park. The cosmos is a kind of a, a theme park created by God where all of his children get to try on different costumes and have different kinds of experiences. And sometimes there are scary rides, but that's part of the fun of being a kid, you know, on a, in a park. You've got to try out the scary rides as well. So that's what I mean by those kind of the four things it has to do for us. 
wow. So you're there. I'm pitching you. Did you get this um, distillation and synthesis whilst you were in Africa? <laughs> I got it from the lightning strike first. <laughs> <laughs> upside the head it's not good. that was literally awakening and so then slowly by slowly I'm what I, I my first book I wrote I wrote it in Swahili and it's called Ukweli Ninini which means uh, what does truth mean so I started examining my own previous personal cosmology based on being raised Catholic based on being trained for eight years in a seminary as a Catholic priest you know and examining every single one of those tenets and saying if I had come from a different faith tradition or under a different culture, would I believe that particular, you know, tenet? If I would say, yes, no matter where I was born, I'd believe that. Like, if I hear, for instance, uh, uh, do not do to other people what you would not them want them to do to you. If I were born Hindu or Muslim or Jewish, I would say, yeah, that makes sense to me. So I'd say, that's a keeper. If I found a tenet that, that I said to me, you know what, if I hadn't been born Irish or Catholic, there's no bloody way I would accept that, then I'd dump it. And so I'm making two buckets of my beliefs. The ones which are just culturally induced and which are just, you know, not very important. And the ones which will, will hold true for any person in any culture at any stage of world history. And I said, that's a keeper. And it's from those pieces I'm going to create the jigsaw puzzle of my life. Wow. Wow. So so as you were there, you know, and having these this awakening and really been able to, like, almost... How, like there's a lot to an awakening. It's heart, it's mind, it's 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 energy. It's it's this this whole journey that you're that you're talking about. So then you're then going to talk to your community or or as a, as a as a priest. How was that changing? How you were were you like? How was that changing the the, the gospels? Let's say how was it changing what you were saying? And how did that affect? How did the Vatican uh, like that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of good questions there. Well, the 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 the, the thing is, eventually the the, the uh, Vatican disliked it so much that on October tenth, October fourth, two thousand and ten, I got a letter, two page letter in Latin from the Vatican, telling me they no longer required my services, that I could only represent myself as a Catholic priest if I found somebody who was dying at the side of the road and there was no other priest to shrive from or hear his confession, I could hear the confession and offer him absolution. But otherwise, I could not represent myself as a Catholic theologian. So I'm persona non grata in Catholic churches, which is part of the reason I have a different community. So that was the, the end of your last question. How did I present it to the people in, you know, in Kenya particularly? I was fascinated by a concept that Carl Jung came up with that he called a Gnostic intermediary. And he said, a Gnostic intermediary is somebody who is, you know, au fait or conversant or fluent in two different traditions and can cross fertilize them to their mutual benefit. So I saw that that my job as a missionary was not to kind of ram Christianity down anybody's throats. It was to say, you know, here's the tradition from which I come. I'm an Irish priest, you know, raised as a Catholic. You know, here are the stories I grew up on. Here's what makes sense to me. You know, tell me your stories. And so by learning the languages and the mythology, we can now both of us cross fertilize and find a common ground, maybe a higher level of reality by discarding what's merely cultural and embracing what is global, you know, and even universal in the sense of cosmic. And so that was an ongoing journey where, you know, bit by bit and story by story. And I modeled myself in the greatest teacher of all time, Jesus. You know, Jesus never got involved in theological debates. He would refuse he would always respond with stories and parables. Because the beauty of a parable is every listener can unpack it according to their own evolutionary level. Some people will unpack it literally. Some people will unpack it symbolically. Some people will unpack it esoterically. Some people will unpack it mystically. Depending on where you are in your own faith journey, you're going to unpack the same story differently. Or even at different stages of your own life, you go back to a story that Jesus told us, oh, when I was a kid, this is what I thought it meant. Now, where I am today, I know this is what it might, might mean. And so I was modeling myself on, on, on Christ. And I still do it for my own community. Mostly, I lead off with prayer, with a, with a story. And then I would develop metaphors. And so yesterday, for instance, I was talking about cosmic evolution. And I used the metaphor of the Apollo 11 spacecraft, <clears throat> where the spacemen get into spacesuits. Then they go aboard the spacecraft. They shoot into space, they discard the bulk of it, 
They're now all three inside in the orbit are going around the moon. And then they detach the landing module and it comes down onto the moon and two of the guys step out and they do the exploration and their mission. They go back into the landing module, dock with the orbiter and come back to Earth and then are debriefed. And I use that as a, that's what happens to every human being on the planet. You know, you take on a spacesuit. This is a spacesuit. We call it a body. But you're going to need it for, for mission on planet Earth. And you get into the space, space, space capsule, which is mother's womb, and you're delivered, you know, and then you're, you're doing an exploration. And then at some stage, you got to go back into the dying process, into the orbiter, and come back to the planet from which you uh, initially set out, which you can call it heaven or the afterlife or the other side of the veil. And so I will continue to use metaphors to try to illustrate more kind of uh, esoteric mystical concepts. Wow, wow. I remember, and again, for anybody out there listening, remember how we learned, we learned the biggest majority of, of what we know today as children with stories, yes. you know? And I think a lot of the cultures, I had a, we had a, I had a stint at, at uh, Sufi, being a Sufi for yes. a little while. Yes. And uh, they were the starts, it was all stories. It was all stories. Yeah. And, uh, and through that, they would learn where you were, at what level you were at, what you were not seeing, what you were able to see, and it was a wonderful, it was a, it was a, a wonderful teaching, uh, a wonderful way to know where you would be at, and um, and then again, a few years later, it, it would change as you would yeah. interpret differently, or your heart would be open more, or your mind would be more expanded. So wow, man. So so what what happens a young man when he gets a letter from the the Vatican? Is this something that you were like? had any awareness that would happen or did it set you free? Was it disorientating? Like, how was that period, Sean? <laughs> well, I have a Porsche for getting thrown out of places, Nigel. So I got thrown out of Kenya after 14 years there because of work I was doing in social justice. I was literally butting heads. Uh, the last uh, tribe of people I worked with was a group called the Tugan. And the president of Kenya at the time, a guy called Daniel Toroite Charapmoy, was Tugan. And so I spoke his language. And so I had a confrontation with him because of, you know, um, social justice issues that were happening in his own area. So I questioned him at a public rally in front of 6,000 people. So I was dragged in by the uh, District Security Council, Special Branch, Chief of Police, you know, District Commissioners, and I was given 48, 48 hours uh, to, to quit. But the, the local bishop was a great guy, um, a guy called um, Rafael Ndingi Mwana Nzeki. And I had been sending him information about what was happening. So he phoned the president and said, if this man is thrown out of the country, I'll publish all this material in the local press. And if I can't publish it here, I'll publish it in the international press. So they backed off and I survived for another two years. But then every three years, I'd have to come home on vacation and then I'd have to renew my visa. So I knew they wouldn't renew it. So at that stage, you know, I knew I was, I was done with Africa. So then I came to the States to study and I was part of the, the Diocese of San Jose in, um, in California. And I worked there for eight years. Uh, and then my theology was so out of it. I was advocating for women priests. You know, I was talking about reincarnation. I was, you know, talking about all the different wisdom traditions. So I got kicked out of the diocese after eight years. And then finally, I get, you know, after, after 38 years as a priest, I get this letter from the Vatican. And the, the really the tough thing was, that was the 4th of October, 2010, the Feast of St. Francis, one of my favorite uh, saints. Uh, my mother died on the... Uh, 15th of November. So I go home to Ireland. I spend the last <clears throat> 55 hours with her around the clock. And now I'm going to celebrate the funeral mass for my mother. And I'm going to the church where I was, I said my first mass 38 years before. And this is going to be my last mass in the Catholic church. And I'm on the altar with a bunch of priest friends of mine who are celebrating the mass. And every moment I'm thinking, somebody's going to rush in from the sacristy and said, this guy is being kicked out. What is he hell doing on the altar? Get him out of here. And so I went through the whole mass thinking, you know, I'm going to get yanked off the altar in the middle of my the funeral mass for my mother. <clears throat> so the interesting thing is that every time I got kicked out of some organization, it made, made me more and more free to think for myself and to investigate and to create my own personal cosmology and to preach what made sense to me and to advocate for everybody listening to me. Don't take my word for it. You have to create your own personal cosmology. I'm just telling you what my one is. You know, if some of it makes sense to you, go ahead. But you have to fashion one that's, you know, tailor-made for you and your experiences. <clears throat> so every every uh, chaos 
was an opportunity for some kind of evolutionary kind of move forward. <clears throat> so I look back now and I say, you know, thanks be to God. You know, it set me finally free. The final set of handcuffs was taken away. And now I'm totally free to think for myself and say what I believe. <clears throat> well, and after Ireland, where did you go then, uh, Sean? After after that sort of you know that that deep you know grieving of your of your mother passing and and, and also the the letting no longer being a Catholic priest in that way. How, what what was that that space like for you? Was yeah. it did you feel yeah. the liberation and the freedom? It meant to me that in some senses the term Roman Catholic is a paradoxical term. Roman you know has to do with a specific organization based in a city in Europe. Catholic literally means universal. So Roman, Roman Catholic in sense is a contradiction in terms. So I now call myself a Catholic with a small c, which means universal, which means I have the freedom to investigate all of the wisdom traditions of the planet, no matter where I find them, whatever the source is, and to try to uh, uh, cross-fertilize what I find of value there with my pre-existing uh, personal cosmology, because I keep you know shifting it, moving it forward. <clears throat> So I came back to to uh, uh, to um, Palo Alto in California, where I live. I had already started a young community. In fact, our 25th anniversary is on uh, the, the 5th of June. And it's also the 4th of June is my 50th anniversary as a priest. I was ordained on June, June the 4th, 1972, in a little village in Ireland called Kiltegan, County Wicklow. So I got two anniversaries coming up now. The 25th anniversary of this, you know, non-denominational community called Companions on the Journey, and my own ordination as a priest. Now, it's interesting. For me, I don't believe that um, <clears throat> priesthood is, is a kind of a, a, a place in the hierarchy conferred on you by somebody who's higher up in the system than you. I keep saying to my own community, every single person is a priest by virtue of incarnation. When you volunteered to come to planet Earth and to try to create Christ consciousness, your ipso facto, volunteering to be a priest and how you exercise your priesthood is by learning how to pierce the veil you know in gaelic we call it a chyloid a veil which is uh, sometimes diaphanous so that you, know, you can see through that there's the, con the contact between the mystical and the mundane between the sacred and the secular so anybody <clears throat> anybody in a spacesuit any incarnated being who's able and willing to do that, to step through the veil on a regular basis and bring information backwards and forward, that person is a priest. They don't have to have some you know, dude with a high hat put hands on them and say, I'm ordaining you. Yeah, you were ordained by God when you said yes to God's invitation uh, to come on planet Earth. So there's this great statement of Jesus Christ that I like to change a little bit. He said famously at one time, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 sinners who do not need repentance. And I change that and I say, there's more joy in heaven over one soul who volunteers for incarnation than 99 souls who want to just stay close to God and not go through the rigors of incarnation. Because it's the people who volunteer for life on planet Earth and elsewhere, they're the ones which are you know, allowing God to experience you know, different modalities. And so, when you volunteer for incarnation, whether you're aware of it or you've forgotten about it completely, it took a lot of courage to do what you've done. The question, the, the problem is, we're asleep at the wheel because birth creates amnesia for who we are and what the mission is. And the job is to wake myself up to who I really am, a bite-sized piece of God, who you really are, a bite-sized piece of God, and then to help all of our brothers and sisters throughout the world wake up to the fact that they too are bite-sized pieces of God. And then there'll be a shift. Of, of consciousness, a cosmic shift on planet Earth, when we go to the next stage that I call uh, from Homo uh, sapiens sapiens to Homo spiritualis, people who recognize their own divinity and the divinity of all of the life forms with which they share the planet. And then we conduct ourselves in a totally different fashion. See the power of that one, everybody. You know, that is, that. that. That's real, man. And I tell you one thing, um, it's like it gives, it's it's such a, it's just a wonder, I see it as a, as like there's so much hope in this in, in, in a good fashion that it's, like there's a, there's a, you know, from, and I'll bring in a slight psychological term, like the, there's a cycle of development that's, that's calling your name. It's like, yes, the remembering, the remembering why we're here, remembering to slow down to maybe start to feel into and explore 
finding your own cosmology, finding your own individuality. It doesn't always have to be in the church. It doesn't have to be with a guru. It doesn't have to be that thing called uh, dollar bills. You know, um, there's, there's more to life than that. And if you're feeling a little bit depressed or feeling a bit lost or feeling that you've got all the things that you wanted and you're still feeling that you feel empty and unsatisfied, then maybe it's this is where you could get fed. You know, whether it's, you know, it's like starting to think about it. I suppose, Sean, how would one start to, you know, let's say you have John who's has his own business and um, has his two cars and the, the relationship isn't going great with his wife. He doesn't really see his kids that much. And he's feeling terribly, um, terribly lost inside. And, and the alcohol, uh, he, he's realizing he can't do that anymore because it's, it's hard in the body. Uh, but he's still feeling empty. And, 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 and what would be a point for the listener to start to explore this wonderful wealth of, of what you've presented here? How to start to think about your cause, you know, your, your own self in that way that you've mentioned. What would be one small step that would be heading in the right road? So let me let me divide your brilliant question, Nigel, into two pieces and answer both of them. Uh, um, uh, the first thing I say is that anybody who's serious about the spiritual journey has to become a serial killer. Let me unpack that. <clears throat> to be a spiritual person, you've got to become a serial killer. And by killing, I don't mean murdering something. I mean outgrowing it, transcending. Because transcending does not mean abandoning what came before. It means going beyond what came before while incorporating what came before, like a tree. When a tree is putting out branches and twigs and flowers into the atmosphere, it's not abandoning its root system. But we have to realize that the, the branches and the leaves are feeding the roots as much as the roots are feeding, feeding the branches. So the branches you know, are bringing down chlorophyll and sunlight down to the root system. And the root system is bringing up your nutrients from the soil. So it's a two-way process. So transcending means going beyond your root system, but incorporating what has gone before. So when I say kill, I mean that sense. The first thing is you got to kill your ego. That's the first murder. It doesn't mean that you can abandon it. You can, everybody needs an ego. You can't stop at a red light or tie your shoelaces without an ego. So, but it means transcending the ego, going beyond, because the ego is a great servant and a terrible master. The second thing you got to do is you got to kill your father. And I don't mean your dad. I mean your culture of origin. <clears throat> and I don't mean abandon it, I mean transcend it, incorporate it, and then go beyond it by cross-fertilizing it with other cultures and other wisdom traditions. The third thing is you got to kill your guru. There is no teacher who can take you all the way because no teacher has had the unique uh, set of experiences that you have. So you honor, you respect the teachers, and at some stages you have to go someplace that haven't been able to, to take you. And the fourth one is you got to kill your God. And by this I mean your theology. Meister Eckhart said very, very famously at one stage, he said, I pray daily to God to rid me of God. In other words, we have to get rid of the God created by theologians, the God you know, that, who has a million angels dancing on the head of a pin, that notion that we can tell you what God had for breakfast. We got to abandon that and embrace the ineffable mystery which we can experience but we cannot articulate. So that's the first response, the, the serial killer. Now we've got John that you mentioned. What's John going to do with his life? There are three practices I would advocate for anybody beginning. And the first one is to think seriously about examining the cosmology with which you've lived your life to date. And I guarantee you it's, an, it's, a, it's a cosmology that has been unconsciously acquired. The Jesuits used to say, give me the child until you're seven and you can have him after that. Because by age seven, you know, they've cemented in a programming. The church has done it. Politics has done it. The newspapers have has done it. You know the um, uh, the military industrial complex has done it. So at age seven, you're pre-programmed to respond in particular ways. So you put John in any situation, and he'll respond in a particular fashion. And I say, John, why did you do that? Or why did you say that? Because it seemed like the right thing to say or the right thing to do. And it was only the right thing to say or do because that was the program. So at this stage. John has to take out the program and figure out, you know, I have to examine this program. What parts of it are helping me grow and be happy and be free? And what parts are holding me in bondage? So the first stage is I have to start radically examining my personal cosmology. The second stage then is you have to find some kind of what I call an intentional community. You can't do this journey on your own. There has to be some kind of like-minded people. 
And there are extraordinary groups out there like Alcoholics Anonymous or 12-step programs. People who've you know, looked at the cosmology which had previously driven their lives and realized it wasn't working and now are banding together to create a totally different understanding and help each other in the process. So for some people, that will be face-to-face -face community. For other people, it will be a Zoom committee, community. It might be the group of people to whom you're broadcasting your work, Nigel. You're creating your own form of community. So that's the second stage. Join some kind of an intentional community and have those intentional communities networking with each other. Because the future of spirituality is not mega churches. It is small groups of people networking with each other. And then the third step is some kind of regular, daily, disciplined self-practice. And that could be prayer. It could be meditation. It could be time spent in nature or time spent with little children, you know, three and four and five-year-olds who still haven't bought into the kind of the, uh, the, the model of the world and are still having encounters through the veil. Watch what they're doing, not patronizingly, but, you know, listen to the insights that they have and join with them in their creativity because there's a huge difference between fantasy and imagination. <clears throat> fantasy is the ability to make up stuff that's not real. Imagination is not that. Imagination is totally different. Imagination is the ability to volitionally shift my state of consciousness, enter into different energies and dimensions, encounter uh, people, entities, extraterrestrials, extra dimensions or whatever, angelic beings, whatever you want to call them, dialogue with them, learn from them, and then bring that back and cross-fertilize it with your ordinary waking consciousness. So there'd be the three great practices, a personal a cosmology, an intentional community, and re regular discipline daily practice. <clears throat> That's what's going to get John out of the rut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, wow. And, you know, at this at this stage, you know, in your twenty five years with your community uh, in in the states um, that you meet regularly, and it's it's growing. I'm imagining. What are you seeing as as the main themes where people are struggling? So we're just going to zoom it in a little bit more specifically to the to the ordinary sort of um, challenges that that people can overcome with this. You know, they like, or, or or even another question would be. What are the the complaints or the struggles that you're seeing now at this time on an earth? Like what, what what are you seeing coming into your community? So what I'm seeing is that for a lot of people, you know, who are not really awake to the reality, <clears throat> they're going to just react to the symptoms of a disease. You know, there's a big difference, for instance, in in medicine between uh, allopathy and homeopathy. Allopathy is mainstream medicine, which seeks to repress symptomology. So you go to a particular symptom, they're going to give you a medication or a salve to repress the symptoms, which just drives the symptoms deeper. So it's going to come out as a different set of physiological symptoms. And you repress those, it's going to come out as emotional symptoms. And then you repress those of medication, it's going to come out as spiritual symptoms. Homeopathy is the opposite. Homeopathy is built on the notion of similia, similibus corenter, like cures like. That any kind of treatment that will produce a set of symptoms in a healthy person is going to cure the same set of symptoms in a sick person because the symptoms actually are evidence of the body attempting to heal itself. So rather than repress what the body is doing, you need to amplify and accelerate what the body is doing. And you're going to move through the illness much more quickly because nature has spent, you know, 4.6 billion years on planet Earth learning how to do this. Now, the same thing is true sociologically, that most people will just see the symptoms of our world right now you had rising gas prices, you know, or something like that, or the war in Ukraine, something like that, or the abortion debate, something like that. But these are symptoms of a much deeper reality. So much more people are trying to repress the symptomology. How do we deal with gas prices rising? And they're not going to the core of it. So you have to go, what is the deepest, deepest level? And the deepest level right now, in my opinion, is the twin uh, extraordinary censorship that's going on in our world right now. There's no ability to uh, kind of represent alternative perspectives on any issue. And then we're being bombarded with uh, propaganda. So it's like the twin, the twin facets of how you control the narrative. You shut down any alternative perspectives and you can constantly propagandize a single uh, perspective. And that allows all of the other symptoms to fester and to welter and to, and to get worse and worse. So uh, this is what I've been preaching to my own community. And I'm getting some blowback from it, as you can imagine. That people are really upset that they're having to dig deeper and not just follow what the mass media are telling you to be to get worried about or are fearful of or angry about. 
because they're always pointing us at some new way of being upset about some new issue to kind of disguise the fact that the real issue is that people are not thinking for themselves and those who are thinking for themselves are not being allowed to express the alternative perspectives. So I would say the real core issue here is this piece. Uh, I had a powerful vision in November of 2012 where I had an encounter with, you can call it an extra dimension or whatever you want to call it. And what I learned was that our world is at what I call a trifurcation point, not a bifurcation point, but a trifurcation point. Uh, one group, so Homo sapiens sapiens is trifurcating. One group is what I call Homo sociopathicus. They're an elite oligarchy who are taking control of the world's resources, including the, the uh, mass media, pharmaceutical, agriculture, politics. And so they're a group of extraordinary greedy people bent on warfare who want to kind of uh, significantly reduce the world population. The second group is that they're trying to create, as I call it, Homo artificialis, that there's a program to create human beings, a transhumanist version of humanity, which is both programmable and hackable. So not only can you not speak your truth, you can't even think your truth anymore because you're being programmed to think what they want you to think. That's the second group. And the third group I saw was what I call Homo spiritualis, a group of people who are dedicated to being awake, refusing to becoming Homo artificialis and confronting Homo sociopathicus. That is the struggle of our, that is the struggle of our planet right now. We're in a battle for the soul of Gaia, of Pachamama. And that's what it has to do with waking up to the realization that this is the agenda that we're up against. I love that. I love that, Sean. And I know years ago, from a very, very small stand, standpoint, I, I was always worked as a like a herbalist and, okay. and I specialized in, in colonics oh, and, uh, at one stage. And I remember was so sold on, on cleansing and it's so important, I have to say, still to this day, it's a big part of my life. But I was, I was, I was, I was noticing that whenever this, I, before I studied psychologies and, and went into psychotherapy, I started to realize that when people were suppressing their emotions, yes. that they were getting constipated, you know, and, and this was quite confronting for me because I had put all my eggs in this basket and said, well, this is the golden goose treating the physical body. But I had to challenge that viewpoint because it wasn't really working. If I did the aftercare, if I if I observed, how did how did Mary get on with that? Then it came back again. Absolutely. And and so it's about again just from that physical physical. Uh, we had I had the blinkers on. I was studied. I was conditioned that this was the way. This was the holy grail. It wasn't, and it was very refreshing then to open that up and expand that uh, to be able to take in and say, well, let me look at let me look at um, how this person's relating with their partner. How are they? how they are resourced and been able to get, understand their emotions or what are they doing? Are they medicating at the weekend? Or, or So whenever I started then to study that, I started to say, just with this one experience and for the viewers out there, we got to keep expanding it. We, we can't keep, you know, relying on old um, outdated information um, because it doesn't serve us. It doesn't allow us to kind of move forward or often it holds us back. And uh, I love what you're saying. You, you made it in a very, detailed and expanded way but in a very individual way that was how i started to shift as my father used to say take the blinkers off and, <laughs> take the blinkers off. and uh and, and it's really helped and it's helped me personally but then i see when when you can look at things for okay let's look at how am i doing because you talked about the physical body as well there sean and and how important it is and i love homeopathic uh, sort of approaches you know, all of that is so important where we can, you know, it's not, let's not suppress the symptoms, let's find out what the cause is. And mm -hmm. you're seeing to have really went to find out what the cause is that's affecting everything, the mind, the body, the energy, the, and you've distilled it into this great, great wisdom. And, and, and you said that some people in your community, um, you said that you were being met with some, some right. whiplash with it. Yeah. Yeah. What is it, what is it that, and this is to the viewers out there, because a lot of viewers will, maybe have say that's only that's not true or they'll have disbelief but what is it that's happening when someone's confronted with a reality like this what is it that's coming undone that's producing a defensive or uh, like what what goes on in someone whatever they hear what you're saying uh, you're a psychologist as well and you know this way nigel that there's this phenomenon called cognitive dissonance 
that when person, a person has embraced a particular mindset or a belief system and has dedicated their life to following this, whether that's a religious belief, a medical belief, a political system, whatever, and you confront them with evidence to the contrary that shows them that what they're putting, you know, their faith in is a very flawed system. You know, it creates cognitive dissonance. If I adopt this new kind of set of data, it's going to pull the rug out from under everything I've stood for. So, you know, I can't afford to do that. You know, at this stage of my life, I don't have the energy or the will, you know, to start creating a whole new cosmology for myself. I'm going to string... a. Uh, uh, cling nicely to the old model. And so I'm going to bat out the new data out of my consciousness, you know, and get angry at the person who presented me with the evidence. I'm going to, you know, kill the messenger because I don't want to listen to the message. So I think cognitive dissonance is the main feature. And that's allied to the fact that <clears throat> the vast bulk of the, of the propaganda machine and the mass media are telling you the old system, you know, and the people who are being telling you the new possibilities, they're being regarded as conspiracy nuts. You know, so you shouldn't listen to those. So you're getting messages from all around. Don't abandon, you know, what you have known to be true, that in which you've built your entire lifetime. You know, you're, it's too late to be changing, you know, putting the rug out from underneath yourself. Stay with the course. You know, this where, this is the truth. So that cognitive distance is responsible for people being unwilling to face new realities or new data points. Now, this is fascinating to me because as a scientist, my, my, I had a double major in college, pure mathematics and mathematical physics. And what I learned is that the scientific method can be applied to any human endeavor. The scientific method goes through the following stages, typically. Whether you're a geologist or a mathematician or a psychologist or whatever you are, you're going to go through these stages. And the first stage is you make observations in your field. That's the very first stage. You start gathering your data. The second stage is you begin to identify some kind of a, a possible pattern in your data. The third stage is you set up a theory that might explain this kind of putative pattern. This, the fourth stage is you have to set up some kind of an experiment, a controlled double blind experiment to test your hypothesis. If it proves adequate, that's just by statistics because statistics, if you get a 95% uh, uh, race uh, of possibility, that's regarded as the truth. So they'll allow for 5% discrepancy. So now you have to repeat your experiment in somebody else's laboratory. If a bunch of you know, experimenters get the same result, now you've established a scientific principle in the field. You put together a bunch of principles over time and you've got a scientific model of the field. And that's the, the system that you're operating with as you examine your field. But and eventually some new anomalous data will present themselves. So now you've got to tweak the old model to accommodate the new data and you're trying to squeeze them in at the edges. But at some stage, so much anomalous data come in, no matter what you do, you can't cram them into the old system. And that happened just twice in the 20th century with um, relativity theory in 1905, you know, and with quantum theory in 1920. There was no way the existing Newtonian model could accommodate these new two uh, facets. So you had to create a whole new, brand new model. And we're still struggling to find a unified field for this. Now, the same thing is true about life, about sociology or religion. You know, you have to look around you, make your observations. You have to kind of create a hypothesis to explain your observations. You have to set up an experiment, you know, um, check with other people who are doing this. When you meditate, do you have the same kinds of experiences? If you spend time around little children, is this your experience? If you go into the desert and do a retreat, a vision quest, is that the kind of experience you have? You go through exactly the same process. So you create a principle, then you create a model, then you have new anomalous experiences. You try to cram them into the old model. It won't work eventually. You have to dismantle the old system and create a brand new one. So you go through the same scientific method. But that's a lot of work. And a lot of people don't want to do that work. And there's only one sin in the world, Nigel. There's only one sin. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's not the Six Commandments of the Church. There's only one sin. It is the refusal to wake up. Everything else is just icing on the cake. Everything else is just collateral damage. The refusal to wake up is the one and only sin, which is why Christ would say, if the householder knew when the thief was going to break in his deal, he wouldn't go to bed. Socrates, the unexamined life is not worth living. Go to Siddhartha, I am Buddha, I am awake. That's the only virtue is being awake and the only sin is being asleep. Wow. Wow. That's, there's a whole lot of other sins that the, that the, that, um, the, the, <laughs> That I was taught about as a, as a, as a, as an altar yeah. boy in the Catholic yeah. Church, who wanted to become a priest at one stage, and um, yeah. I'm loving this now. This is it's actually it's refreshing, and I suppose to the viewer who, who who's listening here, you know, it's you know, it's um, it's not something that you have to do overnight. It's a process, and it might yeah. take you a life. 
Uh, and, and if you don't, and if you don't achieve it, that's a worthy process. Yeah, you know? And, and it can start with the things that, you know, what Sean's been talking to here today, you know, and, and one of the, one of the best experiences that I ever had about, the, I suppose, an experiment that fostered a, a new way as community, you know, like to have other people, you yeah. know, it's really because sometimes we waver, sometimes we're, we're kind of not sure. Sometimes we're, you know, but when we're with other people, you know, and, and you get around like-minded people uh, or people who are kind of on the road a little bit. And you named AA as an example, your church, you know, I, and I even would stretch it out to say in any sort of group where people come together to want to find out what's truthful or to, or to understand themselves a little bit more, whatever that looks like, you know, and it, through that process for me, I, I realized, wow, I, I realized that, wow, I can get resourced outside of myself. You know, Absolutely. and that was the first step. That was the first step, Sean. And and I'm, I suppose I'm using this example is because so many of the clients that I see on a regular basis, that's all they know. And a lot of listeners, all they know is to be so heavily self-resourced where there's faith is, you know, whether it's faith in the church, it's falling. I spoke to a, a priest recently and he's been trying to get people back after the COVID, but there's nobody coming back. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a way in which they've enjoyed the isolation yes. there always was a tendency for avoidance into the comfortable dullness of an unfulfilled life and it's hard and, and there's a and, and and for me i was there and i'm definitely working at it and chipping away at it so that i, I keep finding this place of distilling my own vision of what it is to be me in this world and defining what feels right and not following the wrong god home you know which is what's often been the case as a, as a young spiritual traveler. Um, and I suppose, Sean, I have, a, have another question that I had someone today ask me when I was telling him I was having you on, on, on the show tonight. And he was saying, and it's about death as well, um, you know, because we're talking about living here, how to live well by what you're talking about, but by not falling asleep at the wheel. Like what would it be like to really awaken? What would it be, be like to, you know, utilize where you've come from, but stretch out further to new possibilities and expand your mind and open your heart and come towards others? His question to me was, how do you let go of someone that you love? Okay. That's a great question. It's a brilliant question. And there's a very simple answer that I'll try to you know, tease apart. Uh, you can't love somebody unless you let go of them, in a sense. Because very, if you're talking about death, particularly letting go of somebody that whom you love, you know, you're trying to hold on to a spare suit that somebody has abandoned. Like it's like um, uh, Edgar Mitchell, you know, keeping his spare suit in his closet and refusing to get rid of it, you know, and living life in his closet, you know, attached to a spare suit. And he's not the spare suit. He needed the spare suit for a mission. When the mission yeah. was over, he got rid of the spare suit. Every single one of us needs this space suit, this physical body, uh, for this lifetime. But the truth is, I believe actually that there's this great Hindu notion that the soul never commits anything like more, even even 20% of its energy to incarnation. They talk about two aspects of the soul. They call Atman and Jiva. Atman is that aspect of the soul that never leaves source, and Jiva is the part that continue incarnates again and again and again. And they use the image of two birds sitting on top of a tree. Uh, Atman and Jiva, and every so often Jiva swoops down onto the ground and is picking seeds and walking around and scratching for worms and stuff like that. You know, and Atman is watching. And then at the end of that, Jiva comes back up and they join each other and they kind of uh, debrief. And uh, uh, Atman says, "What was it like down there?" And Jiva says, "Well, here's what the ground feels like. You know, when you scratch it, it's really good. It's like scratching an itch. You know, and worms taste really, really good. You know, and there's these great seeds down there, and it's like to be able to kind of uh, uh, to be able to walk around." And Atman says, yeah, and watching it was interesting, but I was aware that there was a, there was like a bobcat in the distance, and I was thinking, oh, my God, is he going to eat the you know, jiva here? And so I was kind of scared for you. I wonder how you get on. So I'm sending kind of intuitive kind of insights, you know, saying, you know, be careful, be careful. Now is the time to come back, come back now, come back now, and you come back up. So in some senses, that's what's happening at death. You know, jiva is going back to Atman, you know, you're rejoining another part of your own soul. And the interesting thing is the people whom you've left behind on earth 
<laughs> they're there to meet you at the other side as well because they haven't abandoned the other side. 70% of who they are is there as well. So there's this hell of a party, not just of the recently deceased, but the people who are, you know, recently bereaved. They're there as well, welcoming you. So you're not letting go of anybody. So loving is the ability to let go of the illusion that you are in the spacesuit. Wow, that's powerful. That's so powerful. I'm, 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 uh, I'm going to enjoy going to the, I don't think he's watching the man who asked me that. And I'll, I'll meet him tomorrow for a tea okay. and I'll, I'll yeah. share that very thing. <laughs> but yeah, to, to really love someone is you have to let them go. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. It's like mission accomplished. Don't leave him on the moon, stranded on the moon. Yeah. Get him back into the orbiter. <laughs> and I, I remember, you know, as I, um, I spoke to, uh, you know, as I was on my wedding day, it was, it was about four years ago, right. you know, almost four years ago. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember talking to my wife and, you know, and feeling into what it meant to be married and, uh, what it, what it was to love. And, and the same concept occurred to me is that for me to really love this woman, I got to let her go here. I can't be holding on tight. Absolutely. I can't have her in my cage. I can't, I can't have her indoctrinated in the Irish cultural um, yes. sort of, you know, phenomena of uh, being locked away uh, out of sight and having to do all these things. And so that it's so many levels where we have to clean that old cultural stuff, those old stale beliefs, those old ways of grasping tightly to things that don't serve anymore. And I, I, a lot of what I've heard today is you is this letting go of and, and getting the support around you to be able to let go of these old things that don't really serve anymore, but have have become crutches or sort of familiar in a way. And I suppose I suppose one of the main things you're talking about that you're going to have to grieve through this process is the grief of familiarity. Beautifully put. Beautifully put. Absolutely beautifully put. So I'm sure you're finding as well in your psychology practice that I certainly see when I'm working, you know, with couples, uh, that there's like three stages to the dance. The first stage is people meet each other, you know, and they're kind of, uh, they're presenting the persona, the mask, who I'd like you to see. <clears throat> I'm this charming, intelligent guy, and you're this kind of coquettish, you know, effeminate kind of darling woman. And you're putting on your persona, I put down my persona, and there's two personas dancing with each other. It's not the real me and the, and the real uh, person I'm in love with, it's the infatuation stage. I'm not in love with the other person. I'm in love with the idealized version of whom I want the other person to be. So I'm going to put on the mask that tells them that she's going to show them the part that they would like to see. So you get the two personas dancing for the first three or four months. And then slowly the two egos begin to peep out and then their arguments happen. And eventually the masks come off completely and there's two egos battling with each other. Now, if they're lucky and they're prepared to do the work, eventually this leads to the soul's emergence. And there's two souls dancing with each other at that stage. And there's no grasping with souls. There's grasping with ego and there's grasping with persona, but there's no grasping with souls. Because then you're two totally free people, literally bathing in the energy of God, love and God type. But a lot of couples aren't prepared to do that kind of work. You know, to do the egoic stuff, letting the ego go. And that's part of what I say, you know, you got to kill the ego in order to kind of be a spiritual person. You've got to kill the ego in that sense as well, transcend the ego in order to be a kind of a, a, a contributing member in a couple in a relationship. Yeah, exactly, where there's actually a deeper exchange that's happening because one of the main things, and again, uh, you know, I don't want to waver too much off, off topic here as we're coming to the end, but I think this is important is that, yeah, it takes a lot, it takes work to be in a relationship that's conscious. It takes less work to be boats passing at nighttime in the Absolutely. ocean, you know, like a practical relationship, we could call that. And it really takes work to have. And, and, and if we had a stage in our, you know, you know, in a marriage or relationship after three years or 10 years or 15 years and it's feeling flat, then there's work you can do. And what we're talking about today is that work that's going to bring you alive and possibly bring that relationship alive if the two of you journey into it together. Absolutely. You know, and there is there's hope. If there's a stagnancy, if there's a lostness, if there's a medicating taking place, if yes. there's a sort of dullness, if there's a sort of unhappiness, mm -hmm. if there's a constant conflict, drama, repeat, repetitive sort of patterns of um, just chaos that I'm, that I'm meeting a lot of, the, especially through these times of when we don't have control, a lot of these defaults seem to be coming up for people, these old 
all sort of knee-jerk reactions where they create more pain and suffering. If any of this is happening, there's another way. It starts with starting to think about your life. It starts with maybe moving towards an individual, maybe joining a, 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 a group. Sean's details will be here if you're drawn to this wonderful, expanded, not dogmatic, open, heart-centered sort of uh, community. Um, or maybe it's moving towards a group. Or yes. maybe it's talking to, talking to somebody that you admire in the community. It's definitely not um, doing it by yourself because that's this... Yeah. It's not possible. And also maybe letting go of these sort of doctrines and ideals of living, you know, these these you know, these sort of things that kind of keep you uh the thing that I've learned about ideals is they jack up the nervous system, you know. <laughs> you either you either get disappointed you haven't achieved it or you abandon it for another yeah. one and it's just it's a rock and roll ride that never gets you anywhere and it creates yeah. suffering and anxiety. Yeah. Um yeah, so if you guys there's another way and it's yeah. definitely people it's definitely really think, starting to think about your thinking about your life it's about definitely if you're kind of lost and not knowing exactly then it's by joining the community of some sort and i suppose sean as we're just coming to the end here now you know what would be share something from your ceremony uh that you had on sunday there what was a pivotal moment and we can end with that today what stood out as something that you wanted to share to to the people who who were there with you on sunday what's something that you could share with us today either similar or whatever you're feeling that well, how could we end today as we mean to go on so thanks thanks for the invitation nigel so um i know you've been involved with uh, grief counseling you've been involved in kind of hospice style work yourself with the dying over a, a multi-year period of time I've been fascinated for years and years and years with the uh, uh, near-death experiences and the literature of near-death experiences. So I was using that yesterday as a kind of an image as well, that uh, what people typically report having been to, declared you know, clinically dead and then being resuscitated initially is some kind of a darkness, a dark tunnel, and then a light at the end, which gets brighter and brighter and brighter. Uh, and it's so that it's really, really bright, but it's not blinding. It's like <clears throat> it's like uh, love uh, liquefied as light. That's that's the sense of it. And they're drawn as they're pulled forward. And then the next stage is <clears throat> there's a voice that invites them, you know, to come uh, uh, deeper and, and look at what's at the other side. But then there's a barrier. They're not allowed to go all the way because if they do, they won't come back. <clears throat> so at that stage, they're invited to do a life review. And it's not somebody, somebody can wag their finger and say, you bad, bad boy, Sean. You know, you did X, Y, and Z. It's not that. It's saying, okay, you know, you've lived, let's say right now, I've lived 75 years. You've lived 75 years. You've had this uh, near-death experience. We're sending you back. You know, what have you accomplished? And what have you not accomplished of the mission you set yourself 75 years ago? What have you followed through on? And where have you kind of missed the ball? And I go through this, oh, I see there was an opportunity here that I happened to, I must exercise, there's something else I need to do here. You know, there's something else I need to say or whatever. And so I said, okay, we're going to send you back so you get a chance to do that. Now, I think that uh, the life review is the opportunity to come back and do better, you know, what you've left undone. I said yesterday to my community, planet Earth is having what I call a global near-death experience right now. We're in a very, very dark period, but there is light there. And the light is getting brighter because there are people like you all over the world, small communities trying to shine lights and the lights are getting brighter and brighter. Not that they're blinding us, but that they're loving us and they're inviting us forward. And a voice is telling us, you know, let, this is what it looks like on the other side, where there is no strife, there's no warfare, there's no battle for resources. This is what it looks like over here. Now let's review what you've done as a planet, you know, for the last since Homo sapiens sapiens arrived, which was just 70,000 years ago. Let's see how you've, uh, how you've have fared. You know, what have you done well? What have you done badly? Okay, so there's the barrier. We're not letting you go further. We need you to go back. I know you go back, and we want you to pick up on what you've done because of the life review and do it very, very differently going forward. So that would be the message I would want to, to leave, leave with anybody who's listening to your broadcast this morning. We're having a near-death experience, a global near-death experience, and we've reached the barrier there's a loving being saying to us, we want you to do a life review, and now we want you to go back and we want you to do it better. What does that look like for you, whoever you is listening to this podcast? What does that mean for you? Oh, 
powerful, powerful Sean. And yeah, like what's it like, guys, just to take a moment to to feel into what Sean's just invited us to do there. It's just to feel into like to review our life at this time of change in the world. I don't think it's a change where we're going into the darkness. I think we it's getting it's dark, but we're moving towards the light. And I think the light is going to be of change of of um starts with your reflection of where you're at. Uh, where you get less caught up in the symptoms of the struggles. Let's look underneath what's going on. You can say, oh, I'm constipated. No, I'm actually feeling really sad. <laughs> I'm really feeling sad and I haven't been able to talk about my sadness. Mm -hmm. So where in your life are you constipated or, or, or holding in or off, off, off track? In? Mm -hmm. What a wonderful way to end, to begin in this mm -hmm. way, Sean. Okay. Um, so thank you, Sean. Thank you for your heart. Thank you for your your wealth of wisdom. And golly, it's gonna I'm gonna watch this a good few times to really <laughs> digest the, the 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 beauty and uh, and the truth that takes time to to really. It's taken many years to distill here and um, to honor it. I'm gonna take my time to really, uh, and I invite everybody to do the same. And so yeah, everybody. First of all, thank you, Sean. Um, thank you. A big, big a big, big hug to you and Nigel and to your family. Thank you very much, Sean. And you know what? Um, I, this is, I, I'm very sure this will not be the last time that we be uh, talking together. Um, it just feels the warmth is here, the heart's here. And so what else do you need for, yeah. for something to continue? Um, yeah. and, for the, and, for the, and for everyone watching, thank you. If you enjoyed today, hit a wee like button or a share. And if you think there's somebody who could benefit, you could, you could pass it on to somebody just so that we can get the message out that there's another way and you don't have to do it by yourself. And yes, we are in a time of change and that change be, can be more towards the light for you as an individual when you take a moment to pause and listen to the things that Sean had talked about today, the four, the four, the four things that can help you really work through your, understand your, your cosmology and, and really start to know that the biggest sin is to not wake up. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you.